All right, hi everyone. Hello, hello. How's everyone doing? Good. Everyone have a nice weekend? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I finally went to San Antonio this weekend. I liked it. Who's from San Antonio? Anyone? I liked it. It was a nice town. I liked the Alamo. I liked the Riverwalk. Um, SeaWorld sucked, though. I was so disappointed by it. I don't care about the documentary. It wasn't good. I like the filter fish, not blackfish. So, did anyone ever, has anyone ever been to the Orlando SeaWorld? Isn't it like 10 times better? What? No, no. Yes, it's much better. Anyway, I wasn't. I wasn't impressed. And there's actually a legal angle here. So, yes, I know the documentary. They treat their animals very poorly. But, but even worse than that, you know there was actually a trainer killed by one of the killer whales. I mean, imagine that a killer whale is, is dangerous, right? And she sued, claiming that SeaWorld didn't give her enough notification that the, ha the workplace was hazardous. Yes, the, the, the estate. The estate. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Right. So the, her estate sued, claiming that SeaWorld didn't give enough notice, right? Okay. So actually, the Court of Appeals, D.C. Circuit, held that she can sue. That, that, that under the Occupational Safety and Healthy Regulations, uh, Health and Safety Regulations, they need to give notice that killer whales are dangerous. And I guess they didn't give notice. Um, there was a dissent, though, which I love, that said, you know, bull riding, whale training, daredevil, sky jumping, right? These are all very dangerous pursuits that people love doing because they're dangerous. Um, so as a result of this case, uh, the new SeaWorld Shamu show, they're not allowed to actually make contact with the killer whales. They can't go in the water with them. They can't touch them. And they can kind of like do this. They kind of went close and didn't actually make contact with them, which I found fascinating. Uh, so the show was not very good. I did not, I did not like it. And it was, I got a little bit of a tan, though, but that's about it. Yeah, that, that's, 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 that was a highlight of SeaWorld. All right, questions, what's in your mind? Yes? Would you consider meeting with us at uh, 5.45? Is Professor Korn going to be off? Okay, so so this is a setup question where he asked me this in advance, so I want you to present it. So <laughs> thanks, thank you. You played the role. Oh no, we were, I, I'm on top of this. So Thursday, that's fine with me. If you want to meet here at five forty five on Thursday. I mean sorry, Wednesday. Five forty five on Wednesday, is that okay with everyone? Yeah, next door, we'll meet there. It's the same room, so just sit where you're supposed to sit. Is that cool? All right, I will uh, tell your fellow classmates they don't show up an hour late. Uh, and I will I will send an email. Uh, class of five forty five. That's fine with me. We get ever early. I don't I don't really care. It doesn't make a difference to me. Okay. What was that? Well, yeah. I, see, I would love to do that, but they won't come anywhere at seven forty five. Do you think they're gonna come on a day with another class before late? There's a zero percent chance of that happening. So, you guys are pretty good though. Yes. Oh, the Ario case. Uh, so, only because he asked. Uh, this is the case that discusses uh, Ario. Everyone know what this is? Ario. So, as you know now, it's basically impossible to get broadcast TV over the internet legally. I'm sure you all have pirated streams and illegal ways of doing it. What? Illegal? No. The reason why is that broadcast TV is copyrighted. You can go and plug your TV into the air and get an antenna, and for free, you can get a signal over the air, right? There's no problem with that. You can even record that for yourself, make personal recordings in a DVR or perhaps a TiVo or whatever, right? What happens if someone else puts up an antenna for you and instead of putting it on their DVR, they stream it to your DVR? So there's a company called Aereo. Instead of having one little antenna, they have thousands of individual antennas, and each customer gets their own antenna. So all the TV stations going through the air go over this one antenna, and they go directly to one person's DVR, TiVo, right? So the question is, does this violate the copyright? And the Supreme Court will hear arguments on this manana, tomorrow. Uh, I don't have any strong... I feel like Dora, right? Right. <laughs> You're in Texas. I don't have any strong feelings in this one way or the other. Uh, I'm not an IP guy. That's not my, not my area specialty. But this could significantly change the way that broadcast TV works. Because if this flies, people won't actually need to have broadcast TV. They can just get it over these little devices. Uh, the TV networks have threatened that, oh, if this wins, we'll stop offering broadcast TV. We'll go to cable only. I don't believe them. 
<laughs> but uh, we'll see. So what do you think, Bill? Right, so whenever you do something to make it um, protect intellectual property, you will cut down an innovation and you will cut down the ability to access stuff. So there's always this tension, even like with the Vanna White case, right? When you say that you can't reproduce Vanna White's image, you're limiting creativity, you're limiting the, the, the ability to, to create ideas. So in the too, I think is the fact that you can fast forward to commercials. Yes. So I mean I, I mean I don't have a DVR at the moment, but I've had them before. And you stop watching commercials. You don't watch them. And and the networks hate that. So what's interesting is they've actually gone to different mechanism. And is only bad allergies? I'm getting really bad today, and my voice will probably clear up. Uh, so I'm gonna take one of these cough shops. So actually, what a lot of the networks are doing with TV, not that I watch it, is they're making the live events a big deal. Like they're having things on Twitter that you can follow along, and they're having various content online. They're actually making live watching an entire social event. So that's one way the networks are trying to make people watch TV without skipping the commercials. I just skip all the TV. It works much better that way. All right, what else? Yes, Kurt, thank you for that late question. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so the, the, the answer is yes. What about him? Yeah. Is he Prince again? Is he Prince again? Ah, the Prince is rising. Yes. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Anything on your mind? Anything lingering? All right. We are almost done. We're we are at. You can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but you soon realize it's actually a train coming closer to you, progressively getting bigger. So, don't run the other way. Hop on the train. And, and take it home. Uh, right? So uh, the exam, the sample exam has been up there for a while. The sample answer has been up there for a while. Uh, a number of you told me you've done it already. I'd highly recommend that. If you don't, uh, actually, I got an idea. If you want to do the review session on uh, Wednesday instead, of next Wednesday, this way you're already here earlier, and it won't be so bad if you're for three hours. You want? To, I wanted you the last day of class to come in for three hours, right? You want to do it this week. That way, we're starting at 5:45. We'll be after 8:45 instead of going to like 10. Do you want to do that instead? Yes. I don't think there's anything in the exam that requires the last two days of class. So, does anyone have any objections? We'll do the review session this this week, like. In two days, they won't have a problem with that. No, no, but you, then, then we'll have two classes next week, two actual lecture classes. Uh, we'll just shift the classes. Do you want to do that instead? Yeah, Any objection? Yeah. What? We'll have to move classrooms. <laughs> Sorry, we'll have to do that one to this one, right? Uh, the the benefit to that is you don't have to be here till ten o'clock. <clears throat> Everyone okay with that? Yeah. All right, I'll I'll then that'll send an email for. So we'll do we'll do the review session. This Wednesday, we'll start off in that room, and then we'll, <laughs> I guess we'll switch to this room. Your criminal is a 90-minute class? Perfect timing. So we'll start in that room, then we'll switch to this room, and we'll go over it, okay? All right, I'll send an email. And then that way, next week we'll have two lecture classes, and we'll finish up the course. Okay. All right. Maybe I'll make a note for myself. Yeah, this will be easier. This way you don't have to be here until 10 o'clock. I don't I want to do that too anyway. This will be a lot easier. Yes? Yes, the practice exam, here's exactly what I'll do. We'll start there, 545. Uh, uh, I us print them out, I guess. I'll hand out printed copies of the exam, okay? I'll hand them out, proctor it, take 90 minutes, then we'll switch to this room, and I'll spend the other 90 minutes going over the exam. Deal? Okay. okay. Yes, ma'am? Yep. You don't have to come for the first 45 minutes. You can come... You can come at 7.30 or 7.15, whatever. Not that I have. I don't know why I <laughs> <laughs> Okay. In, in theory, yes, you can skip it. Right? All right. Any, any other questions? Anything else? I, 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 James, I see your hand, I, your hand, your hand going up or no? Okay. Can we, can we start? Can we start? Yeah. Okay. Let's talk about landlord tenants. Uh, I don't think anything we're doing in this class is in the practice exam, so you won't be missing much, but we need to pay attention to it anyway. So in the last class, we talked about what happens when the landlord messes up, right? 
is when the uh, landlord doesn't make the premises available. You know, there's a holdover. They don't get rid of him. Okay. Today, the topic is the opposite. It's when the tenant messes up. And a tenant can mess up in a number of ways, right? The way we often think about is when a tenant stops paying rent, right? That's, that's the easy one. The more complicated one is where a tenant does not comply with a condition of the lease. So say the lease says, uh, you need to get permission of the landlord for any repairs, right? You need to get the permission of the landlord to do this. Uh, you have to comply with all local safe and healthy laws, right? All that's fine. But what happens when the landlord determines that there's been a breach in one of those conditions? If any of you ever had a dispute with a landlord, I'm sure you've recognized there might be times you disagree. He says, you breached this condition? The tenant says, no, I didn't breach. I'm doing it okay, right? The landlord says, you're breaking this law? And the tenant says, no, I haven't, okay? Those disputes are fine, except when the landlord decides to take the issues into his own hands by either throwing you out or moving to evict you, okay? The purpose of landlord-tenant law is to smooth that process over, right? To try to eliminate some of the hostilities that can arise when the landlord thinks you're breaching and the tenant says, no, I'm not breaching, I'm doing it right. So it's not just paying rent or not paying rent. You have to think also about the conditions of the lease. Now, virtually everything we've done today concerns um, stuff that was not in existence at the common law. Almost the entirety of landlord-tenant laws evolved in the last, I don't know, 30, 40 years as a matter of either statutory right or, or the courts developing these doctrines. All right, any questions on that before we get started? All right, so we'll look at we'll look at two different things, right? Today, the first case discusses what happens when the uh, the landlord tries to use what's called self help to kick out the tenant, tries to change the locks, throw out his stuff, right? Under the common law, that was usually permissible as long as it was done in a nonviolent manner. But under the uh, modern approach, it's not good. Can't do it. Okay. And the second case deals with duties to mitigate. This happens when a tenant breaches a lease and he moves out early, or perhaps he never moves in at all. Does a landlord have a duty to try to mitigate the, the, uh, the damages? Does he have a duty to try and find a new tenant to fill the unit? Under the common law, the answer was nope, he doesn't. You sign a lease, you're on the hook. But under, of course, the modern law, especially in New Jersey, you now, as a landlord, have a duty to try and find a new tenant. And this is who decrease waste. So these are two main topics that we'll be talking about for today. Right, questions before we get started? All right. Amar, can you give me the facts, please, of the, uh, the first case, the Berg v. Wiley? And um, there was a five-year term lease for a property that was originally being used by Berg's brother, I believe, uh, for a pool house. Mm -hmm. And then um, Berg took over and then started remodeling to make it into a restaurant that apparently was not up to code mm -hmm. to help those. And um, in the agreement, Wiley had it that any uh, repairs or remodeling had to be approved by the landlord prior to uh, starting the mm -hmm. remodeling and all of that was done. So letters were sent to the tenant by the attorney, by the landlord's attorney, saying, hey, you didn't make the, uh, you didn't, you know, you breached the contract essentially, and you're not up to code, you have two weeks to yeah. make all the remodels and bring it up to or you're going to be kicked out. Okay, good. So let's pause there for a minute, okay? So, <clears throat> lady signs a lease, open restaurant, okay? And a couple of the conditions of the lease. One says, any kind of re repairs, remodeling that you make, you need to ask a, a landlord first and written permission, okay? And the second one said that you have to comply with all of these state and local health and safety codes, right? Neither of those seem like particularly... Um, difficult or complicated provisions, but they kind of are, right? 
So first of all, what constitutes repair? What constitutes remodeling? They might have different conceptions of what you need to require written permission over. Like what if they want to move some chairs, move some tables, move some furniture, right? What if they want to paint a wall? You know, you can actually argue over how trivial these things are. The second one, though, is much trickier. How do you determine if you're in violation of health and safety laws? Is merely getting cited by, by an inspector a violation of the law? Well, usually not. Usually for the government to say that you're violating the law, they need to do a hearing. Right? They need to bring before a judge and say, here's the facts, and maybe there's some mistakes. So the mere fact that an inspector found whatever violations, that itself is not necessarily a violation of the law. Okay? But in this case, the landlord took it upon himself to say, wait a minute, I saw these inspectors giving these red flags, okay? so I'm going to find you a violation of the lease. It's not clear there was a breach, but the landlord himself thought breach. Now, Justin, what was kind of lurking in the background? What else what do you think was motivating the landlord in this case? What's that? What breach? What, what breach? I'm sorry. Someone else's summary. I appreciate your candor. That. So, um, what do you think was actually motivating? The landlord here to move so quickly. I think because he's listening to his lawyer as well. Well, he's listening to his lawyer, but what else happened? What happened almost immediately after the lady was, uh, uh, left the premise? Yeah. Least, he leased it to someone else, right? Why did you get that? Yeah. Is that your thief, too? Talk about stealing your tiles or something? Oh, yeah, taking the. Yeah. So in this case, one thing that was motivating them, right, was he wanted to let let that to somebody else afterwards, right? So that was probably lurking in the back of his mind that they wanted to rent that to someone afterwards. Okay. But he, once they found out that there was this dispute, that what did the landlord try to do to try to get it right even quicker? Um, so the uh, at the on Friday night. <coughs> They tried to set it right there. The uh, police officer show up and said, "Hey, they want it over the weekend, do it on Monday." Right. Right. So they had this conflict, right? And you, you can imagine how creepy this is, right? That this lady is in her restaurant, right, with her friends, and this guy is like peeking in the awning, saying, "What's going on? What's going on?" And you know, this is why we don't like self-help. I mean, you might think of this like you know this this bold image of the landlord storming in and kicking out these uh these 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 bad tenants, but. These are people. They're sitting around the table, right? They hadn't actually, like, they've been paying the rent. Like, they hadn't actually done anything wrong. And this guy's saying, you got to get out. you got to get out. Right? So she calls the county sheriff, right? And maybe she knew him, whatever. And then he calls the city uh, police. And they all get there. They're all converging on the site. And the cops say, listen, let's leave everything as it is till Monday morning. We'll call our lawyers. Just maintain the status quo. Okay? And uh, uh, Brian did the... Uh, did the landlord maintain the status quo? What did he do? Um, <laughs> this guy's a character. What did he do Monday morning, first thing? Probably you probably have to crack the dawn. Change the, lock. Change the locks. Yeah. So, so Monday morning at the crack of dawn, right? Right after the cops told him, keep the status quo, don't change anything, the dude changes the locks, right? And then at some point, the, 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 the owner of the restaurant walks in and, and you know, I'm sure she tries her key. <laughs> it, it doesn't work. It's like, damn it. Right? So, uh, so Brian, then what happens? After she tries her key and it doesn't work. Okay. All right, Sh Sherry, what, what, what? Yeah, she sues, right? Yeah. That's always the answer. She sues, right? So, so, the, so they go to court. They file suit. And I, this is the point I was alluding to before. Uh, he changed the locks on July 16th, and by August 1st, he rented it to someone else. Oh, right. He changed the locks on July 16th. Two weeks later, he rented that to someone else. So we can assume from these facts that he was moving so quickly because he had another tenant in mind, right? And perhaps there weren't even any violations that were worthy of terminating the breach. Maybe he just kind of made them up or exaggerated them because he wanted this new tenant. He 
pre- he apparently didn't like this restaurant, which was you know serving light beer and other pool. Doom, doomed to fail. Wasn't a Family Affair a Mary J. Blige album? Was it? Yeah, I thought it was. Anyway. Anyway. Yeah, that was a good, good song, yeah? No more drama. So, so Robert, what, what happened in court? <laughs> Yeah, he was not peaceful. Why was he not peaceful taking back the property? Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. Good. So, so this case, it's a Minnesota case, um, uh, represents a uh, shift in the way the courts view what's called self-help. I mean, did you say self-help in torts? I'm guessing, or in contracts? You ever see that phrase, self-help? Yeah. Okay. Self-help means you take things into your own hands, right? Someone wrongs you, instead of calling the police, you, 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 you punch them. You know, someone, someone steals something from you, instead of calling the police, you go and take it back. Self-help. If you have a tenant that's holding over, you go in there when he's not looking, you throw his crap on the street, and you kick him out. You change the locks. That is self-help. I actually had a circumstance where a, um, one of my, one my uncles had a live-in housekeeper. He was quite old. And he passed away. And after he died, the housekeeper wouldn't leave. And it was a very weird situation because um, she had no lease. She was living with him to care for him. And after he died, she refused to leave. And, you know, my uncle's kids were trying to say, you have to go, you have to go. And she refused. And they said, Josh, can we just change the locks when she's out? I'm like, don't do that. You're going to get in trouble. Fortunately, they listened to me. Uh, I think at the end, they actually bribed her to leave. They gave her a lot of money to just get out so they wouldn't have to do with litigation. And, and that worked. But you cannot go into someone's house and throw them out. Not even in Texas. I know, I know this is probably going to kill you. But Texas does not permit self-help. Okay? This is, this is straight from the Texas Code. Not making this up, right? It's called a forcible entry and detainer. If you are the landlord, you cannot enter for the purpose of kicking them out to surrender a possession. Right, you can enter to perhaps do maintenance repairs or whatever small things, but you cannot enter to make the person surrender. Okay, this is defined as an entry without consent. Right, the only way that you can make someone leave an apartment in Texas or just about any state is by going through the law, and the law prescribes very specific procedures. Excuse me, that you have to follow. Right? And these procedures are designed to avoid that awkward conversation when the dude is peering in through the window saying, hmm, or when the guy comes at the crack of dawn Monday morning with a locksmith to swap the locks, right? We don't want that because you can imagine people who start punching each other and, and shooting each other. It's just Texas, right? This, this can be very bad. I mean, forget about trying to wrangle cattle, trying to kick them off their land. That's a big deal. All right, so I'll get back to the, the, the details of the Texas law in a few minutes. But we do not allow forcible evictions anymore. So the court discusses a lot of the common law rules about self-help. And they basically say that these are very dangerous, right? It's dangerous because when you have one person trying to kick someone else out of the land, people feel threatened, right? You, it might lead to violence. Yeah. Are you talking about with self-help? Well, I mean, if you go to the judicial process, I guess it would be considered ouster. The correct, the correct word is eviction. That, that, that's the correct word. I guess. Yeah, I usually don't use ouster in that context, but it, it, will be, it would be, I guess. Okay. But beyond the risk of physical violence and, and physical force, right, one of the worst possible reasons for the self-help is that the landlord might be wrong, right? So imagine the easy circumstance. Tenant gives a check to the landlord. The landlord loses it. It happens. The landlord says, you didn't pay rent. I'm going to kick you out tomorrow, right? Totally, totally a mistake, but that would result in a serious disruption to a person's life. All their stuff is thrown in the street. You know, they're kicked out. There's no guarantee they can come back in. 
okay, a, a more complicated one. Landlord says you violate a condition of all these housing code violations, right? What happens if, you know, maybe the violations can be fixed? In a short period of time, they can fix the violations. You've now kicked the person out. So modern property law tries to prevent someone from being kicked out, you know, prematurely, right? Try and, get, uh, try and stop them from being kicked out before you have the right, you have a judge, right, someone independent. Do we trust the landlord to be honest about whether this person actually complied with the lease? Of course not, right? If he's moving to evict the person, he already has some sort of interest in getting him out, maybe getting someone else in. So we want an independent, neutral judge, even a housing court judge, somewhere in the process. Okay? All right, so they basically say you can no longer rely on this self-help. Okay? The reentry was wrongful because it was uh, without consent. Now, let's see, uh, Chantel. Chantel? Hi. Does it, does it, does it matter if the reentry is violent or not? Does, does there have to be any violence? Does that make any difference? Any threat of violence? Do, do the court say, so, so what happens? What happens in this case if they change the locks and no one's there? In other words, there's no actual confrontation. Would that make it okay? Why not? Right. So does the absence of violence make it okay? Exactly. So even if the uh, retaking of the premise is nonviolent, right, there's no physical confrontation, that's still impermissible. Right? Even if like, you, know, you seize the property when they're on vacation, they're out of town, they won't come back for a week, that's still not allowed because the law doesn't want to permit that. We don't want to encourage people to take the law into their own hands. That would be bad. Okay? So as a way to avoid um, the difficulties of foreclosure, most states have instituted something called summary proceedings. Uh, has anyone ever been involved with one of these? I heard someone say, mm-hmm. Hands? Anyone? Okay, the purpose of the summary proceedings, summary means fast, is to provide a, an expedited mechanism uh, to uh, uh, deal with, with, with landlord tenant disputes. So in the book, they mention that with the, uh, with the summary proceeding in Minnesota, in as little as three to ten days, you can kick someone out. So don't rush, right? Bless you. So of course you might be able to throw someone out right away in one day, but if you wait 10 days at the most in Minnesota, you can get a judge to approve it. So I mean the delay of having someone stay in the apartment for 10 days is not that bad. And when you consider the cost of throwing someone out prematurely, these procedures make a lot more sense. Okay. All right, questions on that? David? I think they also said like these summary proceedings that on average if the tenant kind of contested it could take as much as like 180 days to get a judgment for so it's, it's, it's not necessarily cheap for the landlord to do it. Right, okay, so that's right. So um, in, the, in, the, uh, in the notes they discuss how long these summary proceedings can be. They mentioned that in the District of Columbia on average it's 114 days. So we're looking at you know, roughly three months, I'm sorry, almost four months in D.C. to evict someone. Um, in Massachusetts, it can be up to two years. Okay? In New York, it's required to give 30 days notice, and then it takes between three to six months to evict. So all these layers of process which make it fair make it much more difficult to evict someone. Right? And there's a cost. Right? If you learn nothing else from me, everything has a cost. Everything has a cost. Who bears the burden? of all these administrative procedures? The tenants. the tenants. Why? Because if I'm a landlord and I need to keep this person in the apartment six months rent free, by the way, people usually don't pay rent when this stuff's ongoing. That's usually why they're, that's why they're in court. They haven't paid rent. So if I have to keep a tenant in this apartment rent free for up to six months, two years, I'm going to get that money from somewhere else. I'm going to charge higher rents to everyone else because I know I'm going to charge them a high rent when they can pay it, because if they can't pay it anymore, I'm going to get zero for probably for six months. So there's, there's great things about these laws, but of course they have costs, and these invariably increase the amount of uh, uh, rent for everybody else. All right, so how long does it take in Texas? So 
This is, this is the section of the code. It's 24.005. And generally speaking, in Texas, you get three days written notice to vacate before you go to court, right? What's the reason why you get three days of the written notice before you vacate? Maybe you can settle this before you go to court, right? By giving someone three days notice, you say, oh, crap, here's a rent, or oh, crap, let me fix this, or oh, I'm sorry, I thought you got the check, got lost in the mail, let me give you another one, right? This is a last-ditch opportunity before you involve the judicial system, right? You can imagine if you didn't have this waiting period, someone could go straight to court. Now, now the tenants get a lawyer to hire you guys and do all these other things. But giving a three days written notice gives them an opportunity to perhaps resolve it outside the court. Okay. So well, then what happens after this uh, uh, three day notice? So the, the process looks something like this. I've heard different things, but generally in Texas it takes about three weeks to evict. Does anyone have any different experiences? Last semester someone had a lot of property and they knew about this. David? Yes? No, I'm saying, is it fair? Does or does not? Doesn't. Fair to whom? I mean, if it's, if it's like home, three weeks sounds like a pretty short amount of time. So here's the process, right? So, so, so here's the process, right? So when you're renting, three days written notice, okay? After that, a citation has to be served, right? You need to actually serve the citation. Usually you have a sheriff or whatever serve it. This process takes about eight to ten days. The reason why is you need to give someone six days notice before hearing. So you effectively need to serve them saying, hey, in six days, we're going to have this hearing. And, and on average, it takes about eight to ten days. Okay? And then you actually have the hearing, which uh, is probably not too formal. Uh, lawyers are not needed, but they may, be, they may be helpful. Okay? So after the hearing, the judge will issue, uh, I call him a judge, but the, the official will issue some sort of ruling, either on the spot or they might delay the ruling. Okay? Mm -hmm. Then you have five days to appeal the, the hearing, okay? And then after the appeal, you can go all the way up to, to court and to the, uh, the, the circuit court, all the way up if you like. After the judgment's final, you have two days' notice. And within 24 hours, the sheriff's required to vacate notice, basically kick you out. So from start to finish, it takes about 20 to 23 days. That's the minimum. Minimum. 20 to 23 days, give or take. Um, if there are various continuations, uh, appeals, other f stuff, it can take longer. John and David, you think, you think three weeks is not even close to fair? I think uh, there's probably situations out there where like, bad things happen to folks and it's just not reasonable to like, kick someone out of their home in three weeks. But what do you think would be a reasonable period? A couple months, I would say. Like, I mean, like can, they give you like how many weeks do they give you for unemployment? You know, like what a year, something like that. Don. I think you're dealing with like squatters or something like holdovers. Somebody that's paid their school and then the last they haven't decided whether they want to stay or not. Then the short is better, right? But if you're dealing with somebody that's been doing their use. And they stop paying. Mm -hmm. By the time you file an eviction notice, they're already 30 mm -hmm. days past due. Like they've been in the property not paying for it for the month. Then you check on the reason why. Right. So, so I think Don Don's on the right track. It's not just three weeks. Usually landlords give, I don't know, maybe you have a different experience, but landlords will tend to not do this immediately. They want to try and perhaps salvage it. They, they might. They, they might run straight to court on the day after your rent's due. Like your rent's due the first of the month, and they'll give you notice on the second of the month. And then they'll go to court in the fifth of the month, right? Bill. Yes. 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 I mean, the purpose of this is to let the parties settle this out themselves. Because litigating these things are not cheap, even for the landlord. They have to go through this process. Right? I mean, it, it could it often be the case where litigating this is actually more than the rent's worth. Right? So I was just some other hands. Anyone else? So the um, process, again, varies by states. Uh, but, but in Texas, at least, it's about three weeks. And I think in New York, it's three to six months. Is that a hand? The law says three days. It does not say three business days. So we can. We, 
Monday. Not at the movers. No, no. You, the notice is filed Friday. You go to court Monday morning. Right? <laughs> now, now, yeah. Yes. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, that, that's the subject of the next case, right? <laughs> I love when this happens. Yeah. Just because you're evicted doesn't mean you're off the hook for the rent. Well, there's no breach of contract. We're in property. So, say, breach of a lease. There's no contracts here. <laughs> Well, that's why you hope they work it out, right? If there's any prospect of him paying it out, you hope he stays there, right? But this usually by the time a landlord's evicting someone, they're not going to get paid. They know it. They're they're trying to get the unit back to recoup their losses to rent to someone else. They can get a judgment against the person, but it's probably worthless. They're not going to collect. Because if they might pay, they'll stay, right? Why would someone knowingly get evicted and then pay the rent anyway? They won't pay. And, and I mean, yeah, I mean, they're going to pay their rent somewhere else if they can afford it. But by and large, I don't have, I don't have numbers on this. When someone gets evicted, the, the, the landlord won't see a penny out of it. That's generally what happens. The, your only hope is to relent the unit to someone else and get some more rent money. One other thing that, that the book mentioned, which which just for some of you to think about, there's one downside to going through the entire process of summary eviction, which is it kills your credit, right? Having an eviction on your credit record makes your credit score very, very low. In the old days, if the landlord just threw you out in the street, there'd be no record of it. So I mean, not saying that's better, but one of the negative consequences of this entire procedure is that lots of people probably don't have very good credit to start with now have an eviction on their transcript. Yeah, transcript, yeah, I'm in school. Transfer on the permanent record. All right, questions on this? Okay. So let's talk about, and this, this is the effect of the question that, that James asked a minute ago. What happens when the, um, what happened? What happens when the tenant vacates before the end of the lease, right? This, this is the subject of the, of the New Jersey case, which I actually have a, a photograph of. So th this is the, um, the Pierre Luxury Apartments in, in beautiful Hackensack, New Jersey. Ever been to Hackensack? There's nothing there. But this is beautiful Hackensack, New Jersey, where a one-bedroom apartment goes for $1,800 New Jersey. In Hackensack. Yeah, right? Uh, here's, a, oh, here's a video with awesome music. Look at that. That's beautiful. The perfect home for the movie was so we get divorced immediately. Or we'll never get married. I didn't tell you. The poor couple, the poor guy. His wedding's off, loses his apartment. I think that's a bad luck. Lose your wife and your apartment in one week. Anyway, I'll, I'll spare you the rest. But it's still there. It's still there. They're still renting up units. It's, it's a quite tall structure. All right. Uh, <laughs> can you do the facts of the case, please? Okay, that, uh, all right. Uh, uh, David, can you do the facts of the case, please? Um, basically, the defendant was being tried on the injury due to fear. Uh huh. Basically, couldn't take the apartment. The letter does say why you released. Yeah, and the reason why is why, why did he buy released from the lease? This is actually really sad. Poor, poor guy. Well, yeah, right. So he was about to get married, and his uh, parents were supposed to be paying the, the bill. I'm guessing the in-laws, right? He was a little vague about that because he only had a stepfather. So I'm guessing his in-laws, you know, the mother-in-law and father-in-law, were going to be putting the bill for the rent. The marriage fell apart, and then he has have an apartment. Now, I don't know, but it discussed after the guy went to law school. And Hackensack is, is roughly near where the law school he went to is. So I'm guessing he was planning on living there. I mean, the lease started in August, which is when the school year began. 
So I'm guessing he was supposed to get married before the law school started and live there with his wife while he was in law school. That's what I'm, I'm guessing. I don't know. I have no facts to say that. So she probably did herself a favor. Uh, <laughs> she got out while she could uh, because this guy seems pretty crazy, right? Over, what, a $4,000 damage, he litigated over half a million dollars. You hear that note at the end? He spent, what, a $400,000, $500,000 litigating? He could have settled the case for $800. But he spent half a million dollars litigating it. Okay, this is why lawyers shouldn't litigate their own cases. This was an absolute waste of time and money, horrible waste of time and money. I, lo I love that anecdote at the end, though, where they said um, uh, he cited one case from Oregon, and the other lawyer says, "Oregon, we don't need no case from Oregon. This is Jersey, right? Oregon's for salmon, right?" And then after he won, he sent them a copy of the opinion, and inside was a piece of salmon. Yeah. <laughs> Guy was nuts, so the girl probably did the right thing. But <laughs> so he 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 sends this letter to the landlord saying, please, my, my marriage fell apart, my life fell apart. Don't I can't I don't have the keys. I never even went there. Don't make me don't make me move in there. James, what what did the landlord do after he uh after he got that letter? Um, what do you do? Did no did he evict him? No. Now, what did he do? Or, or better question, Don, what, what, what happened after the, the guy sent the letter? He ignored it. Right. Did he, did, he, did he let him off the hook, Don? No. Okay. So he, he ignored the letter and didn't let him off the hook. So in the, Don, in the mind of the landlord, was he keep, kept being owed rent month after month? Okay. So even though the apartment was empty, right, the, the apartment was vacant, he was keeping him on the hook for rent Month after month after month. And that adds up, right? Every month he wasn't there, he added up more and more rent. Okay? Uh, let's see. Did there, was, uh, Adam, was there any, any effort to relet the apartment? Did you ever, like, advertise it or try and rent it out? Why do you think he made no effort to relet the apartment? Well, as long as he didn't make an, an effort, the other guy was selling the hook for the contract that he was operating with trying to build the Okay, that's right. So under the common law, he knew, or maybe his lawyer told him, this, this poor law student is on the hook for the rent, right? You are going to get this rent. Now, he would have to sue him and collect it, but under the common law, there's no duty to relet the apartment. There's no duty to what we call mitigate damages, right? But of course, this is New Jersey, right? So the common law is not good for much. Now, now, Bill, there was one mention in the case that someone else was interested in, in renting the apartment, but he didn't want it. What happened there? Right. So there was actually, I think, the mention in the case that someone was interested in re renting one of the other apartments, and he could have rented the one in question, but he didn't. I guess he's saying, I'd rather have two tenants than one, right? This guy is guaranteed to pay me rent. I don't need to, you know, I don't need to worry about the other guy. So all the rent added up. And he sues him. Uh, and he basically sues him for the months unpaid after he moved out. Okay. Um, there was another case, this Riverview case, which is what we call a companion case. So uh, you might not have seen this before, but very often a court of appeals or state supreme court will take two cases with different facts that present the same issue. And it makes sense they consolidate them. Why decide the same issue twice? So the facts here are substantially similar. Guy starts a lease. He moves out somewhere in the middle. Landlord doesn't relet the apartment, and the landlord sues him for the unpaid rent. Okay. So the issue in this case is whether a landlord has any duty to mitigate damages, right? Whether any, whether a landlord has any duty to um, uh, try to reduce the amount of money owed. Okay. So Jorge, what what did the court do here? Hmm. I said that again. Okay. And which are you talking about the, the the lower court or the Supreme Court? Okay. Go, yeah. Good. That's right. Right. So the lower court applied the common law rule, right? And they said that the landlord has no duty to mitigate at all. Okay. But then it was appealed up to the Supreme Court of Jersey. Dustin, what happened there? That there should be a uh, that there's a push in uh, cases towards a favor of mitigation on the part of the 
to reverse the previous court precedent. Mm -hmm. why, why is there this duty? Uh, I think it just has to do with the, if you're trying to make them look after themselves in a more efficient public cost effective manner. Right, okay. That's exactly right. The court effectively reverses this long standing common law rule. And they say that the landlord should mitigate, right? What they actually do, though, is a little bit more funky. They try to incorporate contract doctrine into property. Even though I kept telling you, I think I yelled at, I think I yelled at uh, uh, James before, and said, we don't, say, we don't say contract in this class, right? They basically treat a lease as a contract. And under the UCC, which I'm sure you're all studying, I don't know if this is contract week, I'm sure you're all studying the contracts, right? You have a duty to mitigate. You have a duty of fairness, right? If someone's about to breach a contract and you can sell those widgets to someone else, you have a duty to do that. And they read leases in the exact same way. Right? There's no reason why they should keep this apartment empty. It serves no societal benefit to leave an apartment vacant so that no one can sit in there. It wastes money for everyone. It's not at all useful. So they, f they find that this is unfair. Okay. Questions on that? All right. So let's try this. Okay. I'm done for tonight. I have those evaluations that we have to do it. I can give them to you next week or I can do them now because we have a lot of time for the end of class. If I left in my room. So give me give me two minutes. I'll run up there. Don't leave. I'll come back. And then we can do them now. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. I'll I'll be back in two minutes. I tend to bring you up guys. And you can leave in Just to clarify, someone may say, one is strongly disagree, five is strongly agree. Every year, someone makes a mistake. And, the <laughs> <laughs> and can, I, can I commission someone to just bring this up serious room 835? Okay. So, I can <laughs> <laughs> There's always one. All right, so I will leave this in, in, in Hannah's trusty hands. God help me. And I will I will see all of you Wednesday at 5:45 next door. And we'll do the review. Okay. Thanks so much. Sorry.